Hello and welcome back to Addicted to Lacrosse. Sorry, we had some network issues and I vanished completely. And uh, Tyler and Melissa had some issues as well, and we basically couldn't get things restarted. So we just stopped everything and restarted a brand new one. And so we will continue from where we left off. And uh, hopefully, I can edit all this into a podcast that sounds like we didn't have any problems. But we'll get to that later. So I guess I will continue with my first awesome, and that would be the Bandits in the second half of the game. Now, I didn't actually see the first half of the game. I just sort of saw the scores uh, a couple of times, but it just sounded like, okay, the rush were dominating. It's kind of what we expected. Um, and it, this is going to sound like you know perfect 2020 hindsight, but I do remember thinking at some point, oh, I should tweet this out just to make sure that, that people know that, that you know, I called it when it happens that we all picked uh, Saskatchewan to beat the Bandits, but I kind of thought, you know, I can see the Bandits making a game of this. I, I still think Saskatchewan's going to win, but it's not going to be an 18-7 to or 18-3 to or, or some kind of blowout thing. I can see the Bandits making a game of it and, and maybe losing by two or three. Um, and then I saw this score, and and it was, you know, 11-4, to 12-5, to or, or something like that. And it's like, okay, well, I guess I was wrong. And then the bandits just turned it on. Um, they, they suddenly the rush couldn't get anything going offensively. Uh, Zach Higgins played really well in the net. Um, I thought Evan Kirk made some good stops, but he got fooled by by some some outside shots that you wouldn't expect him to get fooled by. Uh, and yeah, the bandits just went crazy. This did not look like the team that lost to an Orange Four team the previous week. And so, yeah, kudos to the Bandits. They uh, they fought really hard. They never gave up and ended up winning that game. And, and not only did nobody see them um, losing to Vancouver, but certainly nobody saw them beating the Rush, and they managed to do both. So, um, yeah, so good job, Bandits. Uh, who's next? Tyler, you have any more? Sure. Yeah, most impressive um, play by the Bandits coming back late. Um I know that last week I said, oh, the, the rookies are cooling off and they're not awesome. And I, I lumped Josh Byrne in that group. But you know, he has his moments. And the reality is late in the game when it matters, he's fearless. And last week against Vancouver, they needed a goal to tie it late. He got that goal. Uh, this week against Saskatchewan, they needed a goal uh, late. And he called his own number. The the Vancouver game, he kind of just ended up free and open on an unsettled situation, and but he buried the shot that mattered. And this weekend, he was kind of stepping in and realized nobody was on his hands. And again, like he seconds left in the game, buried the shot that absolutely mattered. He misses that shot, pretty much the game will uh, on the rebound, the game will end and they'll lose. And both times. He seems to have like ice in his veins, and for a rookie, that's most impressive. And I uh, like seeing that in him, and I'm really happy he's out east when I see that stuff. <laughs> um, but uh, to have uh, your rookie number one overall pick score two game tying goals in the final seconds of consecutive games is most impressive. It's something uh, money ballers. You might want a, a way to track that or something like that. Seems like it could be a good idea. Yeah, I'll look uh, into that. Yeah, thanks. Um, Melissa, did you think of any others? Or are we going to go rotate back to Graham? I think we're going to rotate back to Graham. I might just be echoing anything that's already been said. All right. All right. Uh, my next one is uh, goaltenders in uh, this afternoon's game. Um, both uh, Aaron Bold and Matt Vince had a kind of a tough first quarter. Uh, it was 6-5 after one. And uh, I remember thinking at the time, okay, this is going to be one of those really high-scoring games. Uh, but both goalies, um, this was an interesting stat. Both goalies allowed more goals in the first quarter than in the rest of the game. I had the numbers up here a second ago. Um, yeah, Rochester allowed five. Sorry, Rochester scored five in the first and four the rest of the game. And New England scored six in the first and five the rest of the game. So rather than the super high scoring game that it looked like it was, was going to be, uh, both defenses just turned things right around. Uh, like I said, the, the, I was going to pull tenders here in that they were awesome. Uh, they were both standing on their head, both stopped, you know, point blank 
uh, shots from from a number of players, uh, creased dives. They they just seem to be anticipating everything really well. Uh, the defense was really good in limiting those kind of opportunities, but when they came, the goaltenders were right there and and uh, standing on their heads. And it it looked like the the Matt Vince and the Aaron Bold from three or four years ago when both of them were one and one A in the league. And that may not be the case anymore, but it certainly looked like it today. Uh, so uh, props to those two and uh, to their defenses for uh, for an entertaining game. Any more? You betcha. Um, I had an interesting observation from both games. The league, because I imagine it's the league, but they're, they're getting into some topics of advanced metrics, and that being specifically – both games had announcers make references to how a team does in total scoring during a specific quarter. Um, turns out that Buffalo is a great third quarter team. Um, as the announcer said, they have a great uh, scoring differential uh, coming in out of the halftime in their favor. And New England is a great fourth quarter team. Um, pretty sure that this uh, information came down to both announcers from the league um, it's not something I've really ever heard announcers talk about before. And considering the performance put on by the announcers in Saskatchewan, where they couldn't even name the players properly, but they knew that Buffalo outscores their opponents in the third quarter, I would definitely, um, is a, a hint to me that the league is helping push this. And the reality is it's great. Like metrics matter. Most things I do at work are driven by numbers proving that something needs to be done or whatever the other, or to not be done. We can say, oh, that only happens 1% of the time. We can ignore that. Well, if this happens 50% of the time and it's a problem, we need to focus on that first. We make all our choices based on those kind of metrics. And uh, watching the announcers talk about these things is uh, pretty cool. And you see that in... Uh, bigger sports in the, the NBA, NFL, like, oh, they're a fourth quarter team. Like, well, now we know that about the uh, the Black Wolves as well. So um, good job on this by the league to uh, push this um, kind of dynamic and advanced thinking about the uh, games. Um, any more awesomes for you, Graham? Nope, that was it for me. All right, I'm going to have one more then. Um I think last week I forgot his name, but uh, now I don't. Uh, Ryan Lee, uh, a young rookie in Colorado. Congratulations to you and your social media voting crew because five straight weeks he won the NLL versus challenge. And it's the kind of thing where it's possible to stuff the ballot box. So he's got a ton of fans somewhere doing exactly that, or he's knows how to do uh, scripting things with computers, but he got his, First ever NLL goal retired to the versus Hall of Fame or whatever, the Ring of Honor. And uh, that's pretty impressive. Um, now we've got two new challengers this week. But uh, to have them just throw up the white flag and say, all right, he beat everybody. Um, good job by the kid and all those who cheer for him. That's all I got for awesomes. All right. Well, I guess we can start with not awesomes. And uh, I guess mine this week will be kind of obvious, seeing the, uh, I want to say, publicity uh, regarding my, my blog post from this morning. Um, I've gotten more likes and retweets and comments on that one than probably any other uh, article I've written in, in however many years I've been doing this. Uh, and that was about, not specifically the Saskatchewan announcers, the, the article was just in general about uh, NLL announcers uh, and mostly about name pronunciation and getting names right and, and that sort of thing. Um, I won't rehash that whole thing here, that's that's on the blog, uh, though Tyler suggested that I do a sort of a dramatic reading of that, um, which would be entertaining. In the style um, of Andy Rooney, specifically. It's cranky old Yes, man. of course. It's, it's hey. exactly to the minute when he would be coming on CBS when I was growing up. So it's it's That's true. Perfect. Sunday nights is part of 60 Minutes. Yeah. Yeah, I put my vote in for it, too. But I guess we, we didn't win. We can make bonus content after this. Special there release. we go. Cranky Graham. So um, 
my not awesome for this particular episode is the announcers in Saskatchewan on uh, Friday night. Um, and uh, again, we've we sort of gone over this in a number of times in the past, but this was kind of the 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 quintessential example. It wasn't just they said this guy's name wrong a couple times. They said everybody's name wrong a couple times. It seemed uh, on the bandits anyway. I'm sure they got all of the the rush players correct. Um, but we heard about Kevin Brunel all night, or Brownell, uh, instead of Brownell. Um, we heard about Dane Jones, and we heard about Dane Schmidt, and Pat Sanders, and Jordan Dunstan, and Zach Harris instead of Zach Higgins. Um, they, they were just all night. And it wasn't just, well, they said Pat Sanders once. Uh, no, every time, every time he touched the ball, it was Sanders, not Saunders. The game-winning um, goal was by Pat Sanders. That's right. From Jordan Dunstan, I believe. And at one point, they did actually refer to a CFL team. Um, yeah, but Teddy Jenner said, said, uh, tweeted that they talked about the Stallions, and I don't even know who the Stallions are. Um, the there, I did look it up, and there's like a Double A hockey team, a Bantam hockey team, or something named the Saskatoon Stallions. So it might have been them. Somebody else suggested that there was a uh, Major League Soccer team called the Stallions a bunch of years ago. There's the uh, um, L.A. Stallions in the uh, Bruce Willis movie. Uh, boy, I can't remember. He's a private detective. It's kind of like a diehard ripoff, but it had a f- fictionary. Oh, with Damon Wayans. Film. Yeah, Damon Wayans was the quarterback for the L.A. Stallions. And I doubt was that the last Boy Scout? There it is. Yes. yes. <laughs> and, um, yeah, I don't think that's what they were talking about. No, probably no. not. But in any case, they, I got this yeah, there was my husband. He walks through and he's like, why are they talking about a CFL team? So I just assumed I actually don't follow it. <laughs> uh, yeah. So that's, yeah, there was, there was just mistakes all over the place and it was, it was painful to listen to. Um, we're kind of used to it because we've seen it from many other broadcasters as well. And I, I mentioned this in my article that, you know, not all of them, I, I don't want to just say, you know, NLL announcers all suck. Um, because there are definitely some good ones, definitely guys that know what they're doing. Uh, sorry, not know what they're doing, but know who they're talking about. And you got the guys in Calgary, you got the guys in Vancouver, uh, you got Steven Stamp, who's not on any particular uh, team right now, but he filled in for Andy McNamara last week uh, on the Toronto broadcast. And I would never get to hear the Toronto broadcast because I'm always at the games. But uh, I've heard Stamp before, and he knows the players, and he knows how to, and he's very... Um, adamant to get to make sure that he gets the names right, and he wants everybody else to get the names right. It's just the point of respect. I mean, good gracious. Yeah, how do you? It is, and yeah. it's it's a respect for the players, and it's professionalism. Because the last thing you we need is for somebody to be uh, listening to the game and hearing them talk about somebody and say, "Well, they 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 said that Dane Jones scored that goal, except the guy's name is Smith." It says right on it, like there's a guy named Jones there. But they called him Mitch earlier. So which is like, I don't know who they're talking about. So, or if they listen to two different broadcasts and they're talking about um, Jordan Dunstan in one of them and Jordan Durston in the other, they're like, is that the same guy? It's like, what? So it's just unprofessional. It does, it, 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 I don't know, it kind of casts a shadow on everything. And anybody who says, oh, the NLL is just a Bush league. It's a Bush league. And, and that's not what we want to see. It doesn't make anything better. It makes it all worse. Yeah. So actually one other thing that they said, and this was, this was weird. I have no explanation for this right near the end of the game. Uh, there was a goal scored and it was in the last two minutes. And the rule used to be that all goals in the last two minutes are reviewed automatically. They changed it recently because they had goals being reviewed that were like, you know, an empty net goal from 50 feet away and they'd go into the box and review it. Well, nobody was anywhere near the net. It wasn't anywhere near the, the end of the shot clock or anything like that. There was no reason to review it, but they pause the game while they do that. So they changed it last year, two years ago, so that the uh, coaches can't call for a challenge in the last two minutes, but it's the rest decision whether or not they review it. But most of the time, if it's anywhere close, they'll review it. So the announcer said, oh, that's why they're reviewing this goal. It doesn't look like anybody was close, but they're reviewing it because they review all the goals in the last two minutes. And then like 30 seconds later, another goal is scored and they're reviewing it. And both announcers are like, oh, why are they reviewing it? Nobody was anywhere near the crease. I don't understand this. Like you just said, this is why they're, they're, 
reviewing the goals. And so another goal happens and they don't know what's going on. So that one made no sense to me at all. You want to know how bad their announcing was? You're, you're Canadian. You don't, Canadians don't complain about anything. And here you are complaining. <laughs> That's how bad it is. So yeah, I, I so I wrote a, this article about it this morning, just saying I've kind of had enough. And and dear broadcasters, go learn the freaking names and figure it out and get it right and make an effort. And so I kind of lost my shit. So <laughs> um, yeah. Is so, this part three of the post? Because I, I know we've you've definitely done this before. Well, I've Maybe done the extent, actual but... list before. So the the list I do every year, and it's just here are the names and here's how to pronounce them. And this was not that. I'm at, I've got another one of those ready, and it'll be out in the next couple of weeks. Um, but this one is what this one was more of a rant about why I have to do this and the fact that I shouldn't have to do this because the league should be doing this, and the league does have a list, but it's wrong. Um, and I heard from a couple of announcers today, most of whom were said, most of them were the ones that I named in my blog as not being the bad ones who basically just said, "Hey, thanks for that." Um, but I heard from a couple of others who, who said, yeah, we, we get a, li a list from the league and we look at one and it says Nick Weiss on the bandits. And they're like, we've been saying it Weiss for years because that's what we were told. Now it says Weiss. Do I say Weiss? Do I say Weiss? What do I do? And and one of them that I talked to today said he literally like waited for a for a commercial break or a, a TV timeout and like ran down to the to the bench or sorry, not to the bench, but to the bandits. Um, broadcast team and says, is it Weiss or is it Weiss? And I want to make sure I'm saying it right. And they said, it's Weiss. And he said, okay. So I went back and, and he continued to say it Weiss. But I think he said it Weiss once because that's what the thing said. And then once he realizes, well, what the thing says is wrong. Well, how many of these other names are wrong? There are also wrong. So it's it's challenging for them. and But it, it does seem that there are, there are those out there who don't bother looking at the list or don't bother making sure that they're getting it right. And that's what frustrates me. I mean, people are going to make mistakes. People are going to say things wrong. Um, Teddy Jenner talked about Matt Vink on his podcast just a couple of weeks ago. And I'm like, of all people, Teddy Jenner, he knows everybody personally. There's no way he should be making that mistake. And I think later on in the same podcast, he says, I think I called him Vink earlier. How the hell do I make that kind of mistake? And so he apologized. And, and yeah, so people make mistakes. I get that. But if it's consistent and it's constant and... There doesn't seem to be any kind of uh, attempts to make it right. That's what bothers me. And it's, there's a big, huge difference between bad pronunciation and completely the wrong name. Like if there was a radio broadcast out of Saskatchewan and you're trying to figure out what happened, like who is Dane Jones? Like, yeah. Do you mean Jones Dane Smith or do you mean Mitch Jones? Jones? Yeah. 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 So that's that's my not awesome. Just the fact that that this is still a thing. It doesn't. It, I want to say it seems to be getting better, but I'm not sure it does. Uh, and maybe it's maybe it gets better because the people that consistently um, are are doing the broadcasts are gradually getting better. But then they changed it to brand new people, and we're back at square one. Awesome. Melissa, do you have any? <laughs> kind of hard to follow that one up now. Graham. <laughs> um, Sorry, really, setting the bar pretty high here. Uh, yeah, because my not awesome really isn't much of a rant for a change. Uh, really, it's just the fact of how the Buffalo Bandits played the first, what, three quarters of that game. They just, wow. It was a shellacking. <laughs> it really was. So you definitely have to give some kudos to the Bandits coming live in the fourth quarter, but the fact is there was some luck on their side in that fourth quarter too. So yeah, just the bandits play the most of the game. It was really bad. So that's my not awesome, which sounds really <laughs> banal after <laughs> your rant. Um, what do you got, Tyler? Oh, um, I'm going to set the stage here. Um, when you get a chance, like there wasn't any, very many games on. So I, I was watching the rush play. I was watching Mark Matthews. And all I could think about was March of 2012. Uh, it was a year that Chris Hall was out not coaching the stealth because he was sick. Um, Paul Rabel, his play started to be a little listless because Hall really, really guided him and made him to the great player that he was. 
So uh, one one weekend in March, uh, Roughnecks come to town. Um, a lot of fights. Paul Rabel actually got into a fight with uh, Pete McPetridge. And then like he kind of was like checked out and like, it wasn't going right. So they traded him to the Rush. Um, so Ethan Iannucci came to the Stealth for Paul Rabel and a first round pick. And that first round pick was Mark Matthews. So when I watch Mark Matthews, like he had a great first half in control of everything. And like he always is this calm, collective, sniping, like setting people up, can't be stopped. And when there's nothing else on, and I just sit there and watch him, I just get mad about the Rabel trade. So that trade coming up on six years later is still not awesome for stealth fans. And uh, that's what I got. Not awesome. Mark Matthews is trade. pretty awesome though. No, nope, I actually nope, gotta nope. watch him play it to you. So nope. yay, pioneers. <laughs> I, I, I just said he's dominant and he does what he wants, but I will not call him awesome. On principle. Yeah. Got to stand somewhere. So that's well, my not awesome did for get, the week. You did get 92 points in two seasons out of Ethan Iannucci. Which is which less is than a, which one is, season for which, Matthews, but still. Which is a good single season for everybody else. And then he went to Colorado, so Melissa got uh, some benefit out of him as well, but even less. I was going to say, I don't remember him doing a whole lot for our team. No, I he remember had the, his first 45. year, I lucked out because I had, when they were doing the fantasy stuff, I had actually gotten him just, you know, on a whim, and he just <laughs> rocked it, and I ended up winning that year because of him. So, but yeah, he didn't do much for Denver. All right, um, I don't have any more not awesome, so I'm going to go back to the announcers and just start ranting about them again. Um, no, I'm please, kidding. Of course. Please make it stop. <laughs> so, um, yeah, Mosa, do you have anything else? I, I think we've kind of beat a dead horse. <laughs> I, I think we're done with that, yeah. Okay, any more not awesomes for you, Tyler? No, I, I, just one. Um, Two games, one not awesome. That's pretty good. 50% for the league. All right, let's go on to uh, an extra topic that we added this, for this week, just because we only had a couple of games to talk about, and then we'll get to our predictions after that. So the uh, the question this week, um, and I'll let Tyler start because he was the one who suggested this, is who is our most underrated player in the league? Yeah, I was uh, watching the game this morning because you know, time zones, everybody else is watching the afternoon, but it was 10 o'clock here. And uh, the uh, Corey Vitarelli comes on for Rochester and scores a goal. And I just think, boy, nobody ever talks about Corey Vitarelli. Yet he probably averages 25 goals a game. I mean, 25, go ah, 25 <laughs> goals a season. Um, like he always puts up points. Um, he's. He's a, he's a Peterborough kid, and he's got this backhanded action that looks just like Grant. Like he's he's comfortable with whatever with the ball in in his stick and getting in and out of trouble, but nobody ever talks about him. And even going back to what we we're talking about earlier with like protected players, they only get five forwards. Like he may not he probably is not a top five forward for most teams. Um, so he could be available for the draft. Like Philadelphia should absolutely um, snatch him up. Uh, but he's been his whole career in Rochester. It'll be very interesting. But nobody ever talks about Corey Vitarelli, but he always produces. Um, it's like just completely steady on his production and never really rises up a ton, but never drops off. And I would say he, to me, Corey Vitarelli is the most underrated player in the league. He scores some really beautiful goals too, and not just yeah. not just quant, quant, uh, quantity of goals, but he he'll dive from behind the net or across the crease. Or some of his goals are just gorgeous. Yeah, he's got a great stick, like great great stick work, but he gets overshadowed with uh, Cody Jamison. Um, so you, he's not he's never been the number one on his team. And in the summer, he grew up. He's playing with John Grant Jr. So again, he's not number one, and he just does his job. Um, he does it well, but. Most people, you, you don't game plan for Corey Vitarelli. Like when the coaches are all like, they know he's going to do his thing. No. So, yeah. Um, I'm going to go with uh, you, Graham. Do you have a choice for an underrated player? 
Uh, I came up with a couple, but uh, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna uh, whittle it down to uh, just the one, and that's going to be Shane Jackson from the Georgia Swarm. Um, when you think of the offense in Georgia, I mean the powerhouse offense is, I mean less so this year it seems, but last year was unbelievable. But when you think of that offense, you think uh, the Thompsons, you think Randy Stotts, you think Johnny Paulus, Kyle Matisse, Jordan Hall. Um, um, I forgot his name, Jesse King. Yeah. Uh, this year, so you you think of all these these high scoring players, and Shane Jackson's like, oh yeah, then and there's Jackson too. But Jackson has been first or second in swarm scoring for like the last five years. And if you happen to look at the money baller stats from this year, which nobody but me can do, Shane Jackson is right at the top of that list. Um, and he's got like a five point lead over anybody else. So, um. Just kind of like Fitterelli in that he's not going to be Mr. Dominant guy that that you're going to base your defense around and say, we got to stop Shane Jackson. But he's one of uh, a group of players on that team who you would have to stop. And uh, yeah, like I said, he's he's been at the top of their, their team scoring for years. Um, but his name doesn't jump out at you as, as somebody who's that dominant, but he actually is. So... Uh, I'm going to go with Shane Jackson as my uh, underrated player. Melissa, what do you have? You know, I actually was having a hard time coming up with somebody because, of course, you always gravitate towards the offense. So I would say just defensive players in general because they are so overshadowed by those silly goal scorers. It just... I think I've made it quite clear. John Gallant is one of my absolute favorite players. And part of that is because if you meet him, he's not a very big guy. Uh, I, I think his stats actually say he's much bigger than he is in person <laughs> because he does not look like he's six foot. Um, he's a small guy. And yet when he was on the field, he's one of those players that you don't notice him. But once you become aware of him, you seem to see him everywhere and he's part of everything. And you're going, wait a sec, what's going on? And I always have this distinct memory of him going against one of the, um, Oh God! I just drew a blank on their names. The three brothers that were all like six foot five. Six the foot Morgan eight. brothers. Morgan, thank you. I'm like, I know this name. I have a friend with the last name. Yeah, the Morgan brothers. And I just have this distinct memory of watching him, and it was, you know, like a chihuahua going up against a great team. But it was he was stopping him, and it was awesome. And so I just think there's a lot of other defenders that are like that that just get overshadowed since you're not seeing them in person and. Uh, yeah, they're not making the big flashy plays, so you kind of over, just don't really notice them. So I would say instead of a, a specific player, I'm just going to say defenders are too often overlooked. We need to pay more attention to them. So. It's true. Glant is also very good on the uh, Mammoth broadcasts. He's been a, a welcome addition to that team uh, in the last year or two. Uh, I don't think he's on yeah, every I think broadcast. This is the second but, season. Uh, yeah, so he does he does a good job, and obviously him the fact that he played for so long and Jamie Shuchuk played for so long, uh, and Teddy Jenner for that matter, uh, makes that a really good team because they they know what kind of things uh, you know fans want to know about and find, and and they can break down the plays as well as as uh, as anybody, but uh, they do a good job of of breaking it down in, into a form that never played the game and uh, and. Yeah, I appreciate that, uh, what they do there. All right. right, we will move on. Oh, sorry, Tyler, no, you had I something gonna, I was going to say what you were saying. All right, we'll move on to our predictions for last week. And one of us got one game right. Uh, everything else was, was wrong. So Party. That, was a, that was a one and one for Tyler. Uh, picking New England uh, to win today. And Melissa and I were both 0 and 2, so our uh, totals for the season. Uh, where are we? Tyler is in uh, third place, bronze medal for Tyler, uh, at 10 and 13, and uh, I'm next at 12 and 11, just over 500. And Melissa is in the lead at 14 and 9. Um, and now we we're going to do our picks for the uh, upcoming games this weekend. There are four of them. 
And I haven't done mine yet, so I will do mine while uh, Melissa tells us what she has picked for this week. Yeah, I gotta say though, at least if I missed all those weekends games, these were some crazy ass games. So I don't feel so bad about mis missing my picks because this minute you weren't sure who was gonna win them. I'm what? pretty sure I don't know if there's anybody who picked Buffalo to beat Saskatchewan. No. Yeah. I wouldn't feel crazy. too bad about missing that one. I bet Grandma Rush did. No, wait, no, sorry, reverse that. See, I'm wrong. Like who? <laughs> Who, they, nobody would pick it. Like that'd be the big absolute homer. I think I had the biggest homer fans, but I picked it for the wrong team. Um, nobody picked that score. Yeah, I, they were four zero. <laughs> Why would you pick Buffalo over them? Um, but we're not talking anymore about last week's game. Let's uh, we're move on to this week's. So Vancouver, Colorado. I am going to choose the home team. A lot of times, I would actually pick Vancouver, just because Vancouver likes to be a spoiler in Colorado. And so that potential is always there, but this team we're just still not sure about. So I think Colorado is playing pretty well. They're probably going to take it. New England and Toronto is a harder pick because especially with New England coming off the win, but, or yeah, <laughs> it's like who did win today? Um, I'm going to pick Toronto. Uh, Rush and the Roughnecks, I'm going to go with the Rush. Calgary has shown some life, but they're still not where they need to be, I think, to beat this Rush team. And I think the Rush definitely have something to prove after what happened to them, because that's a pretty big-ass lead to blow. <laughs> uh, with Georgia and Vancouver, I'm going to pick Georgia. Again, Vancouver's just not shown us the team that they can be, and back-to-back -back games, I think, is going to be even worse. So I don't have much confidence there, but maybe Tyler might. So you want to give us your picks now, Tyler? Sure. Um... Yes, the historically the the stealth as a franchise have done great in Colorado the last ten years, but this year I don't have that. I'm the exact same as you, Melissa. I don't have the confidence in the stealth right now. Um, there's a chance that maybe Reese Dutch has a huge breakout game because he loves playing in Colorado and silencing the fans, but he, he also hasn't shown that's where he is this year. So Colorado over Vancouver. Um, Boy, uh, New England versus Toronto. Um, I think the interesting storyline here is that they, they made a trade a couple of weeks, probably three weeks ago or a month ago with the uh, Sheldon Burns and Stefan LeBlanc. Um, and they've both have been playing better since then. And going head to head, we'll get to see in a sense who won the trade. And um, I'm picking Toronto because they're at home. Um, They've put up a ton of goals in some of their games, so they've got a lot of potential to uh, get out running and um, to, uh, get the home fans behind them and have a great night. So I'm picking Toronto. Rush over uh, Roughnecks. Um, this is the way that battle goes. I think uh, there's nothing in Calgary that shows me that they're going to win. They they just they whine. They don't win. Finally. Uh, Georgia at Vancouver. Uh, Vancouver's second game of the weekend and um, might be a little tough for them to travel, but there's also this thought in my head uh, that uh, Georgia doesn't travel well. They, they couldn't come out west to Colorado and get a win. Now they got to come even further west, probably their worst travel of the year. And um, maybe, just maybe, they'll give the stealth a chance to kind of get their legs under them the night before and just come out and hit the um, hit the floor running from the first whistle and jump on Georgia. Um, also, if I make the exact same picks as Melissa, I don't make up any grounds in the uh, standings. So I got I got to make a little risks here and there. This is my calculated risk of the week. Um, Graham, what do you got? All right. Um, I've got I've gone through mine now, and it turns out that I am going with the same ones as Melissa, so I will definitely not be making up any ground this week. Um, but 4 0 is still 4 0, so that's not bad. Uh, <laughs> bit of a, a long shot there, but I'm okay. So I'm going to go with Colorado over Vancouver. Um, this one was actually tougher than I th thought it was going to be, um, just given the fact that Vancouver won. Um, Last week they got a bit of a bit of a bit of momentum, a bit more confidence. Um, but Colorado's played very well uh, the last 
um, well, so far this season, really. Um, but I do have a, a, a bit of uh, in my database about quarters that uh, you were talking about earlier. And uh, the Mammoth are up four, like positive four in the third quarter, positive five in the fourth, but they're even in the first two. So, hey, Vancouver, if you can score a bunch of goals in the first half, uh, you may want to do that because then Colorado looks like they may be more of a second half team and, and may want to come back. So if you, you'll need to get a sort of a big lead in the first half to, to beat the Mammoth. Now, the Stealth are also negative in the first, second, and fourth um, but they're, they're even in the third. So that's, that's a bit of a, a positive for the stealth. The roughnecks are uh, actually negative in all four quarters. So that's, that's not a good sign. Let's, anyway, moving back, sorry. Let's get to the point where that's a tiebreaker. Like the playoffs start today, the roughnecks and the, uh, stealth are both one and three stealth advance because they have one quarter where they've, they broke even compared to losing every quarter, like the roughnecks. That'd be a heck of a tiebreaker. Actually, the Stealth are the best team in overtime this year. They are uh, one and zero. Yeah. So, what do we have? How does that? I got to keep okay. in mind the Stealth don't have Willie B firing them up anymore. So, I think that was a part of their winning strategy. Yes, most definitely. I don't like that guy. All right, so my next uh, prediction was Toronto over New England. Um, Toronto's just been lights out since that uh, that trade that you mentioned, Tyler. Um, actually, Sheldon Burns was was uh, one of the other people that I was thinking of listing as uh, most underrated because he's just been outstanding since he came uh, to the Rock. Uh, he plays great uh, transition, plays some solid defense, plays smart. He has zero penalty minutes this year, but he seems to be uh, you know playing tough. Um, so yeah, he's, he's been really good. Uh, LeBlanc has been really good for, for New England. Uh, he had a good game today. So it's almost like both teams win that trade. So, uh, a, you know, quintessential example of a, of a good trade if both teams consider it that they won it. Uh, but I'm going to go with Toronto on that one. Uh, Saskatchewan over Calgary. Uh, yeah, I mean, despite their, their loss on Friday, uh, the rush are still the, the, uh, probably the top team in the league. So I'm going to go for them over the Roughnecks. And Georgia, Vancouver. Um, thought about picking Vancouver in this one as well. Uh, but I I just see... It, it's hard to pick against Georgia just because of how strong they were last year. And it's, it's almost like at some point, we're going to see that team again. And they're just going to destroy everybody. Uh, except maybe Saskatchewan. But uh, it kind of hasn't happened yet. But... Uh, it's it's still hard to uh, to pick against them, so I'm going to go for Georgia in that one, and I think that will do it. Unless you guys had extra stuff to uh, to talk about. No, I am uh, all set for the week. I think this is probably our craziest podcast we've had yet. <laughs> <laughs> probably, um, yeah. So this is, uh, I guess, the end of part two. And uh, I guess it's part two of two, hopefully, because uh, we won't be breaking it up into any further pieces. Anyway, so you, this could, has been... Could you repeat that? You're breaking up a little bit. I can't understand. Oh, good. No, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> so this has been a, uh, a odd episode of Addicted to Lacrosse. For Tyler and Melissa, I'm Graham. Thanks for listening, and we will see you next week.